Good morning. Uh, today is Monday, May 10th. Uh, we have a very special class today, a very special guest. Lama Surya Das is going to join us in just a minute. Um, we're gonna, he's going to do a guided meditation with us at the, at the beginning of class. And then he's going to talk on the topic, which is how to engage with the world compassionately. Um, and then we'll do some questions with him. Uh, let's set our intentions, make aspirations by saying the four immeasurables before we begin. May all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all beings not be separated from the happiness that has never known suffering. May they rest in equanimity, free from attachment, anger, and aversion. So, about today's guest. A voice of clarity in difficult times. Lama Surya Das is an authorized Lama in the Dzogchen lineage of Tibet. Surya Das is a sought-after spiritual teacher and meditation master. He is a poet. He is a spokesman person for the emerging American Buddhist movement. He's the founder of the Dzogchen Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which you can reach, um, look up at www.dzogchen, D-Z-O-G-C-H-E-M.org. Lama Surya Das is also the author of 16 books, including the best-selling Awakening the Buddha Within. He is a regular contributor to the Be Here Now Network, with his Awakening Now podcast. Lama Surya Das teaches and lectures around the world, conducting dozens of meditation and retreats and workshops each year. So please welcome, with much gratitude, Lama Surya Das. Thank you very much, Michael. What a pleasure to be here with y'all. It's a, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much for being and here. Happy Happy Mother's Day and happy parents and benefactors and all's day, all those that we're grateful for who have helped us get on in this life and this world. Yes. And yes, these are stressful and uncertain times. So gratitude and appreciation and togetherness is much appreciated. So it's a good time to get together. And thank you for calling us together today for this. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, if you like, we could just jump right into meditation, which we do every week. And if you, we're gonna, I'm gonna set my timer for nine minutes. And if you'd like to guide us, however you see fit, you know, to, into this nine minute meditation, we would, we would love that. Okay, thank you. I love to, the joy of meditation myself. Somehow I've been doing it now for a long time, and it's still good <laughs> every time, good. whether it's good or not. Who knows? Right. It works. It's great. It helps. It the does. joy of meditation, not just the chore or the spiritual penance, but the joy of awakefulness, of mindfulness rather than mindlessness, etc. Yeah. for these restless and agitated times. So good morning, everybody. Time to awaken. Awaken to the Buddhist, the light, the divine within. Please take a deep breath. I think we should give you a little gong to get going. So we have, you know, a little body memory, oral memory, ear memory, multimedia experience here. From the Asian temple tradition of awakening now, not waiting. It's now or no, oh, it's now or never as always friends. Ah, what a relief. Just breathing, relaxing, and smiling. Why the heck not? <laughs> breathing, relaxing, and smiling. What could be simpler oh, and help us achieve the ease and inner peace that Buddha's enlightenment reveals and we can experience too, even here and now, not after lifetimes or aeons of schlepping towards awakening or enlightenment here and now, the only place we could ever be anyway. Why not align ourselves with it? 
just breathing, relaxing and smiling again, breathing in, breathe deeply and exhaling and emptying ourselves totally. The less of me, the more room for thee, O Lord, O Lord Buddha, however you look at it. And for the third time, that was just practice to warm up, inhaling deeply and exhaling, <sighs> feeling embodied physical sensations in the body and our bottom who meets the seat, physical sensations, aware of awareness itself, just breathing, just relaxing, just being present and aware. Breathe, relax, smile. If you don't feel like smiling, just at least breathe and relax, damn it. Meditate as fast as you can, as no one says. If you don't feel like relaxing, just breathe at least. That's a very important practice. <laughs> don't take yourself too seriously. Your life ain't much fun, friends. The Dharma is joy. Awakening is nowness. Imaho, wondrous, Eureka, yeah, yes, amen. Natural body, just sitting, natural breath and energy, just breathing, natural flow, and third, natural mind, just being present, awakeful, attentive, mindful, rather than mindlessly sleepwalking through life, having all kinds of so-called accidents. Just breathing, relaxing, smiling. Observe the breath, feel the breath, watch the breath, whatever you call it. Attend to the breath, just breathe, damn. Why not? It's happening anyway, you don't even have to do it. Just notice that and let everything else go. Mindfulness of breathing, anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing, breath awareness, the basic awakening, meditation, basic Buddhist contemplation. This breath, only breath, watch it. Stay with it, this moment, only moment. Ah, now this awareness is the true Buddha within. Don't overlook it in your own place and seat. This breath, only breath. This moment, only moment, and letting everything else go. Watch the breath, feel the breath, become the breath, just be breath. Everything else just going by without attraction or aversion, just noticing awareness, aware of awareness. I enjoy the joy of nowness meditation. Focused, aligned, centered, concentrated, awareful, mindful. Enjoying the only show in town this moment, Imaho. Yes. Co meditating into being together. Yes. Thank you. Yes.
just sitting, just breathing, just being present and aware, that's enough and more than enough. If the mind wanders like a puppy, just with the leash of her mindfulness, bring it back to the object of attention, to the pooping paper, to the object of attention, the breath, bring back the wandering attention, the monkey mind to the object of attention, the breath, inhaling, calming the mind, exhaling, relaxing and smiling, letting it all go with each out breath, a little relinquishing, a little death, a little awakening every moment. This breath, only breath, this moment, only moment, openness and awareness inseparable. Enjoy the joy of nowness. Nowness meditation. Everything's part of it. Maho. Thank you, Lama. Welcome. That was wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Um, did you say bring, aware- bring them bells? <laughs> did you say awarefulness? I did. I've never heard that. That's I make up all kinds of shit. I like that a lot. How about awaring as a verb, like mindfuling, awaring along, not just awareness of, but awareness of awareness, like not like minding the mind, awareful, awaring, awareful. Wonderful. I like that a lot. Um, awareness is the higher power in this path of enlightenment, Michael, as you know, the inner power, awareness that we rely on. Yeah, that's what we're cultivating and, and trying to touch yeah. and taste here. Yes, right. exactly. Um, if you like and want to address the topic of engaging with the world compassionately and speak on that for 15 or 20 minutes, we'd love it. And, and um, Yes, with pleasure. That's what it's all about. Uh, I, I'd like to complete our meditation session with a little prayer and a chant that I uh, wrote, wrote on the millennium. I was asked to say something on the radio in Boston here on Y2K, you know, because that was a big deal that never happened. So here it is, my millennium prayer. May all beings everywhere with whom we are inseparably interconnected and who want and need the same as we do. May all be awakened, liberated, healed, fulfilled and free. May there be peace and happiness in this world and all possible realms of existence and an end to war, violence, poverty, inequality, injustice and oppression and pandemics too. And may we all together complete this glorious spiritual journey. One family, one circle, one sangha, one satsang, one community, one heart. And homage to the Buddha, the divine, the light in your seat, don't overlook it. Ah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, compassion in action, that is the name of the game. Cultivating wisdom and compassion, both attention and intention, altruistic, unselfish intention and attention, paying attention to what's going on, to reality, seeing things as they are, not as they ain't seeing things as they are, not as we are with our projections and interpretations. That's why we practice contemplative practices and purification, concentration, meditation, insight, meditation, and so on, to see things as they are, not as they ain't. That's the first step on the Eightfold Path. Wisdom in Buddhism, seeing things as they are, not some theory about emptiness or cosmology. And seeing it as it is, we recognize the dissatisfaction that so much of life calls forth from us in our current state. Dissatisfaction, irritation, and worse, greed, anger, delusion, pride, jealousy, the basic poisons that confuse us and drive us off course. So cultivating wisdom and compassion together like the two wings of a bird, as a bird can't fly with only one wing, we need clarity, wisdom, self-knowledge, and second, compassion and loving kindness and all the transcendental virtues so that we can live an authentic life 
with others and with ourselves. Wisdom and compassion go together. And that's the Bodhisattva way, the way of the spiritual awakener or the servant leader devoted to the highest by serving even the lowest, the Bodhisattva, the awakened spiritual warrior. Now the world is challenging and how to engage with it compassionately if we have unbridled conflicting emotions. And I'm not suggesting suppressing the emotions, but if we look at ourselves, we could see how our greed and aversion, pushing and pulling affects us in the dance of life with everything, with people, with animals, with beings, with experiences. And it's very difficult to cultivate equanimity or center or love, unselfish love, giving without experience, uh, needing in return, true generosity. So engaging in life means including all parts of life. And that is the tantric secret, that is everything is part of it. It's all part of it, that our home is the temple, that our family is the, the song, is the community, and that we ourselves, that our body is the temple, and all of our life, our experiences, that is, are the, that, that's the angel or the divine realm within, what we call the Buddha within, the nirvana that is within samsara, or the light that's in the shadows, not pushing away the shadows, but recognizing there's nothing but light. But how, if we don't clear our windshield of all the caca and schmutz, all the crap that's accumulating on it. So we have clear vision, which is wisdom, which is wisdom in Buddhism, which is wisdom seeing it as it is. So that we can recognize ourselves in each other and feel the other, empathize, feel, resonate with the other, and then being moved to identify with them, if not to help, help as needed, not just compulsively try to be a do-gooder to feel better because it is a difficult world. As Buddha said, the unenlightened life is full of dissatisfaction and suffering, but there is another life, there is another way. And I don't mean other lifetimes. There's the awakened life, the joyous life, the life of interconnectedness, recognizing one and all that we're all in the same boat. But check it out, don't believe me or Buddha, check it out for yourself. Are we not all in the same boat, especially in the shrinking globe in these times? When the environment is so challenged and the very air in the water is challenged, we don't know if our children will have potable water and clean air or not. We need an 18 year old like Greta Thunberg to demand that we do something now, not later. Anyway, we can follow that message and pick it up ourselves and awaken. That's the law of karma. What goes around comes around. It's not just some mystical, airy-fairy, or belief system from another part of the world, Eastern mysticism, some call it. It says that in the Bible, too, we reap what we've sown. So let's try to create good karma through good deeds, and not just good deeds, but good states of consciousness by purifying and clarifying our hearts and minds, bodies, and souls. That's why we do these spiritual practices. This is a very important point so we can recognize our own agency, so we can experience spiritual self-mastery rather than feeling like a victim of conditions and circumstances. Seeing that we're all in the same boat, we all rise and fall, sink or swim together. To put it more in the vernacular, we all want and need more or less the same things, but are just pursuing it through different ways. Taking care of ourselves and each other, thinking globally, but acting locally, this is the way of the awakener of the bodhisattva, of the spiritual hero, which is not far from us. We may feel far from it, but it ain't far from us, I assure you. It's not apart from us and it's not just within, it's within each of us and it's within each every relationship, every encounter, not just with those we love like our family, our mate, our child, our parent, our pet, but everyone and everything, every moment. If we let go a little into it, if we breathe out into it, instead of contracting and being separate and trying to get what we want, what we think we want and need, and really bring ourselves fully into the encounter and have an I-thou relationship, see the light in everyone and everything. That's our practice in Vajrayana, in the diamond path of Tibetan Buddhism, cultivating calmness and clarity so we're not so reactive and we have space to choose how, when, and if we react and respond. And then our whole life changes. 
because when I become clearer, everything becomes clearer. That's very important to remember. Again, that's why we practice. That's why we cultivate awareness, insight, self-knowledge, wisdom. That's why we concentrate and focus on the present moment. So at least we can get into the game rather than living at a little distance from our body like Leopold Bloom. We're here anyway, all the time. Where else could we be? Why not align ourselves with that? Come home to ourselves. If we don't love and accept ourselves, how can we love and accept others? So compassion comes from letting go a little bit of selfishness. Of course, the question is how, and that's why we have practices like exchanging self and others, Tong Len, putting ourselves in the other's shoes, Tong Len, and so on. That's why we have practices like concentration, insight, meditations, to see through the illusion of separateness. As Buddha himself said, when I see myself in others and others in myself, who could I harm? Who would I exploit? So it's a looking deeper. And then compassion comes naturally, just like we feel it for our children, our pets, our loved ones, and hopefully for more than that, just nuclear inner family or nuclear circle. Mother Teresa of Calcutta, the diminutive saint who accomplished so much in the world. Great inspiration to me. Yes, I met her once in India in my decades there long ago. She said, loneliness is the cancer of the modern world. We draw a circle so small and then we feel separate and alienated and alone in the world. So drawing our circle bigger and bigger is the, is the secret of Mahayana Buddhism of seeking universal enlightenment, universal benefit, not just self-improvement, not just self-help program. Anyway, if we look deeply and Buddhism says this, there's no separate self and it can't be helped, but concerned that we're all in the same place. And I wanna emphasize this, we all are looking and needing more or less the same, just pursuing it through different ways, even those that you violently uh, virulently agree, disagree with, and I won't mention any names. I'm sure various archetypal people come to mind. I won't mention any names. And we always jump to some extreme like that. How can I accept that person or that? Well, it's up to you. Since it's there, you can, you can accept it or not. That's up to you. And you will get the results of that. But equanimity does not mean condoning or complacence. Cultivating equanimity is a nonviolent or compassionate act and a way of being there with others, even though with our, let's call them enemies or difficulties. That's why the Dalai Lama himself always says, quoting the Mahayana Buddhist scriptures, the enemy, the crisis, the unwanted, the difficulty, in this case, maybe even the pandemic can be our greatest teacher if we learn from it. For example, how to be better prepared next time, how not to politicize health issues, how to pay attention, how to have early warning systems, and so on. I mean, the truth is that we've heard about this a long time ago, but we were in denial. Epidemiologists warned about COVID and pandemics and exponential growth of pandemics in, in 2008. In 2013, there were papers, there were committees, there were meetings. We didn't want to pay attention to that. The lobbies, the interests didn't like that. This is the problem this kind of ignorance and selfishness. So how we engage in the world compassionately, it comes down to moment to moment attention and intention, interaction. If we can be aware enough, if we can bring the wedge of mindful attention into this present moment in between stimulus, out of stimulus and response, we can choose how, when, and if to respond more principally, more intelligently, more choicefully not just react like knee jerk reflex reactions. And that's the secret of freedom and self mastery. It's not what happens to us friends, but what we make of it that makes all the difference. That's how we can interact more compassionately and lovingly and patiently and inculcate all the cardinal virtues, whatever religion or humanistic system that we wanna call it by being aware enough in the moment to not just react blindly, but to respond intelligently through bringing, I'm gonna repeat myself in purpose is so important, the wedge of attention or mindfulness, present awareness between stimulus and reaction so we can respond rather than just blindly react. And that is the secret of self mastery. And then we can actually engage 
heartfully, soulfully, patiently, compassionately, generously, even with those who might be harming us, recognizing they're harming themselves. Who wants to be around angry, abusive people? No one. And yet our own inner anger, selfishness, greed, sometimes takes over. And we have to accept and recognize that too. And then we have room to make a choice if we want to feed that wolf or feed a different one, feed our pet animal, which is really two sides of the same. And rise out of our animalistic side into our more angelic or you know, divine side. Abraham Lincoln called it our best selves. This is not just some new age or Eastern thought concept. Be who we really are, our best selves. And that's the secret. And then everything we do, as my own teacher, Dingo Kinsey Rinpoche used to say, the Dalai Lama Dzogchen master, Dingo Kinsey Rinpoche, he used to quote our tradition saying, when a bodhisattva like that even rolls over in their sleeve, in their sleep, sorry, <laughs> even rolling over in their sleep, such a bodhisattva is making good karma because of attention and intention, even awareness in the dream, even semi-conscious, there's still nothing but positive intentions being fulfilled not blind unconscious drives and fears. So if we work on ourselves and becoming more conscious and focused, which is the point of this kind of meditation that we've been doing, can really help us to recognize what's going on in the here now and attend to it more skillfully and intelligently. And open our hearts and souls, open our hearts and minds, be more open-minded rather than closed-minded. Who can argue with that? And cultivating acceptance and equanimity and putting ourselves in the other's shoes and feeling what they feel. Empathy is the root of compassion, resonating with others, being with rather than against them, being with rather than against things. But check it out, see for yourself, see if you can see through the illusion of separateness because we're all interconnected. It's so hard if we really check to see where I end and you begin. Even here in this virtual space where you know I'm kind of looking at you, you're looking at me, but we're also hearing and vibing and interacting and we're interbeing as the great master of Vietnam Thich Nhat Hanh coined the term interbeing, not separate, yet not just simplistically one, recognizing the unity and diversity and respecting everything, recognizing that this earth this life, this earth is like an altar and we're like the deities, the bodhisattvas, the angels walking on it. And we're all in this together. Dare I repeat myself? Yes, it's important. We will rise or fall, sink or swim together. And in this increasingly shrink global environment and our current socioeconomic and environmental realities, who can say otherwise? Look at this pandemic. Somebody got it in China or some other diseases, AIDS. They say crept out of the jungle in Africa from a bat, from a monkey bite, from guano, whatever. And now the whole world is, has to deal with it. So how can we just think of ourselves or that we're gonna hide behind the oceans or hide behind our assets here in the first world when the very air and the water we breathe is endangered? and for the future generations, their safety and flourishment is endangered. So awareness is all friends. That's what we talk about awakening. Mindful living, Who want, what are the virtues of mindlessness? Nothing, being mindless, being distracted at the steering wheel of our car of life. We have all kinds of so-called accidents although there's no such thing as causes. And mindlessness is a big one, heedlessness. Thus we do this meditation, hopefully every day, and then bring it into life every moment and cultivate awareness of self and other and respond mindfully lo with loving kindness and compassion and the four boundless qualities, compassion, loving kindness, joy, and equanimity are equal to all. The four faces is a Buddhist love, as in the prayer at the beginning, the four heartitudes, the four boundless, and bring it into every single moment 
Of course, this is an ideal, this is a challenge, but I, I'm throwing out this challenge. Let me pretend to be 18 years old again and naive and innocent and focused enough like Greta, my hero today, Greta Thunberg, who just kicked ass in Davos at the International Economic Forum, telling the leaders of the world. And girly girl Greta was the first speaker, this 18 year old Norwegian who's on a spectrum, by the way. She has her own obstacles to overcome, but it's not stopping her from shaking the world, shaking the tree of truth and seeing what falls off, which ain't true. Demanding that we wake up, that we do something now for the betterment of one and all before it's too late. How is this not a Bodhisattva Dharma message? Is she not focused? We too learn how to focus and center and concentrate. And then we can fulfill or actualize our priorities. Otherwise we're all over the place. So I think of it as a combination of loving awareness and spiritual activism, the Bodhisattva way. Seva in Sanskrit, karma yoga, serving God or serving the highest by serving even the lowest. And service, my dear friends, brothers, sisters, and others. Service is the rent we pay for living here together on this earth. I myself have found what I was looking for in life. We're not supposed to talk about ourselves as spiritual beings, but you know, now that I'm 70, it's time to say these things because if I can do it, you can do it, anybody can do it. I'm not the Dalai Lama. I'm not the son of a rabbi or a Pope. Yes, the Popes have also had kids, in case you don't know, check it out. Nobody's special, no more special than everybody is. Each of us, all of us, all have the spark, the Christos, the divine light within and recognizing that is my practice and has made me find what I was looking for in life, which is peace and harmony, connection, contentment, love with everyone, even those that I don't like or disagree with. Love is so big, unconditional divine love, bigger than the polarities of like and dislike. And I recommend that to you with blessings and encouragement. Blessings are nothing more than encouragement. If I can do it, you can do it. Anybody can do it. That's my message. And contemplative practices, cultivating awareness, waking up rather than putting ourselves to sleep with bad habits, intoxicants that bring heedlessness. And I'm no teetotaler. Look at my initials. I'll spell it out. Lama Surya Das. I'm no teetotaler, but I'll tell you, getting high ain't the all of it. Getting real, waking up finding a light in every one and everything. That's the practice. We call it in Tibetan Buddhism, sacred outlook or pure perception. And thus naturally we treat everyone that way. So I wish that for you, if you choose it. And I'd like to open the floor to questions because that's one of the best ways for us to do this today. Thank you all for joining. Thank you, Lama. That was- Welcome. Very inspiring and very clear, and 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 uh, I love hearing your passion and your um, Thank you. joy, which really comes Thank across, you. you know, very much, and your wisdom. Um, for the students, you can use the Q and A function on the Zoom here to uh, ask your questions. Um, here is a first question from Alejandro asks, how can I use meditation to change my habits? That's the whole point, Alejandro. Like um, we were just talking about, having uh, bringing the wedge of mindfulness or attention in the present moment in between stimulus and re reaction, so you don't just blindly react in a habitual conditioned fashion, but you can choose how, if, and when to respond, maybe now, maybe later maybe respond to criticism with appreciation or patience and understanding. Or maybe if something happens, um, you can put it into creative work later. You don't have to like shout and scream to get it out all out now. 
So it's all about reconditioning and deconditioning. That's why the teachings about karma is so important to understand that what goes around comes around. And the more aware we are, the less we're forced to blindly react, the more we can you know, think before we react. As my grandmother said, Anne Zakharoff from the old country, from Eastern Europe, she didn't know about Buddhism from Shmudism. As she used to say, Jeffrey, count to 10 before you hit back. You know, when I was six years old and a terror on the sports field, count to 10 before you hit back. I said, Granny, how can I count to 10? It's so many. She said, well, at least count to three or think before you hit back. Come on, wake up. She actually said that, wake up. And it was like, whoa, what's she talking about? Oh, I see. I'm like sleepwalking. So that was a great teaching. And that's relevant to us today. And we can recondition. That's about habits and decondition. Even the strongest habits like addictions can be reconditioned and deconditioned. And that's where awareness comes in. Let me give you more of a secret, this Mahamudra and Dzogchen secret. In the now, there is no conditioning. There's no past and future because conditioning depends on memory and habit. Past, present, and future is sequential, linear, time but in the now the divine time as they call it the now the holy fourth we call it in Zogchen, the fourth time it's just now 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 like the beads on my mala my rosary they're connected by the string of memory of identity but each bead is separate from the next if you want to call it separate when we cut the string there's just moments now 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 that's why we practice a combination of concentration and insight or wisdom, realization, meditation, so that we can be now and not conditioned by past and future, past habits and hangups and reactions and future fantasies and imaginations about what never happened yet. So I ex exhort you to plumb the depths of this infinite now. And there is freedom there. Let me go further. Now is the greatest therapy, nowness awareness free from past and future. Thank you, Lama. Uh, George asks, can you speak briefly about your views on reincarnation? That's a gigantic topic, but if you'd yes. like. Yes, briefly. In brief, I asked a Zen master once, I lived in Japan in 74 and 75 teaching English to you know stay in Asia and study Buddhism, make money, they call it. And I am studying Zen, and I asked my Zen master, who was Japanese and spoke broken English, of course. Um, he said, I said, what do you think about all this afterlife and next life and, you know, phantasmagoria of Tibetan Book of the Dead or all these theories about what happens when you die? And he said, Tibetan nightmare. <laughs> it was just like, shoo. I mean, that's only one slice, but still, shoo. Okay. And they said, keep weeding. We were like weeding the garden. Do what you're doing while you're doing it. You don't have to worry about that. Of course, one thing leads to another, you know, the conditioning, the, the nature of things, cause and effect. So who knows? We didn't just start when we popped out of mommy's womb, did we? And do we end when we breathe our last? It's worth thinking about this. If you're going to ask about a big question like reincarnation, weren't we there the day before but popped out or they cut the umbilical cord or eight months before? I don't know. Just, you know, freewheeling here to break down our concepts. And we have to breathe our last. Some people, you know, they come back to life after a near death experience of two minutes or three minutes. So where, does, where do we begin and where do we end? These are cosmic, timeless, evergreen questions. It's worth looking into. So I don't believe in reincarnation or not believe in rebirth. You know, these are almost synonymous. Even though Christians and Jews and most of the world believed in it until like uh, third or fourth century, it's not that foreign. But I have a few intimations and a few experiences to go on. I'm just not a big believer. I'm more like the New York skeptic. But that's why I want to emphasize that if I can find out the answers I'm looking for, you can too. So. Let's think about the future, but not just one's own future. I mean, who can, what continues, what continues? Who brought us into this world before we popped out of mommy's womb and so on. And yes, 
what we do now determines what happens later, but not just to oneself. I mean, who is oneself is really the big question in the spiritual, in the uh, path of enlightenment and self-knowledge. Who is reborn? Who dies? There are books on this. You can read it. Who dies by Stephen Levine? Who, who am I by Ramana Maharshi? It's a question and it ain't about me, friend. It's about you. Who is oneself? The question of identity. This is a big one. The question of self and no self and beyond self. These are all nuances. So here's my short answer. There were longer answers. Yeah. The, the, when we've spoken about this topic before, is it something that people are very interested in? Um, it's exactly what you just said. I mean, the key to that is is to really think about what or is being reincarnated. It's not, and what is the self? Yeah, who or what am I? Right. I'm you. It's it's not so simple. It's not like a mathematical That's, equation, right? Yeah, and it's not either or, and. Um, Maybe it's beyond conceptual thinking, but we can still intuit deeply. Like when we grow up, we find out who we are. You know, you find your voice as an artist or you become a mensch, you know, and you have your way of living that's authentic. Like it's hard to define authentic, but we all know when we're deceiving ourselves, we're people who are liars. That ain't the way. So similarly with this kind of path of uh, about the bigger question, the greater ecology being like, well, the different realms of existence, seen and unseen, you know, in Buddhism, the six realms, but there's so many ways to slice the same pizza. Right. Thank you. Uh, this question is from my friend Rigzin, Rigzin Vasallo. Nice Italian name. Um, <laughs> you've had the good fortune to study with so many great lamas and also sadly to witness their passing. How yes. did you manage your grief when Yosho Ken Rinpoche passed and what is your advice for grief and loss in general? Yes, not small questions. Well, my wife Debbie died two and a half years ago of lung cancer, although she was never a smoker. I experienced grief and loss there. Um, I just read yesterday in a biography of the great 16th Karmapa Lama that he cried when his teacher, Jamgan Kantrol of Shechen Monastery died. And people said, Master, how could you cry? You always teach about equanimity and impermanence and mortality. And he said, but it's, it's so sad. There's so many beings who won't be able to meet him. So, you know, it's kind of a transpersonal way of processing the grief of, you know, losing something for all of us. Like losing a species is sad. Or losing the natural resources is sad. You know, uh, losing, I don't know, the spotted bird or the spotted owl or, or the, Amazon is sad. Anyway, when Yoshi Kempo died, um, my own teacher, Yukupe Mwangyal Rinpoche, who's still alive and lives in France and speaks English, so he said this in English, not my translation. He said, it's like when the guru dies, it's like the, the string is broken of his mala and each disciple or each devotee gets one of those beads in their heart. Like it spreads everywhere instead of looking to it, like, where is he now? Is he in Nepal? Is he in Bhutan? Or, you know, is he coming soon? But opening to the bigger guru or, or, or uh, archetypal principle, the big guru not the personal Tibetan man who could be 70 or 80 years old or woman who could die. And so I still have that relation. So to put it in English, my gurus are always with me. But that took some getting used to. With my parents, you know, I grew up with them. So if I said they're always with me, it's not such a stretch. And I don't mean they're haunting me like ghosts, you know, in the clouds, but I know what they think about what we're doing now. You know, they think this is a great thing. They're proud of what we're doing now. So they're always with me. That's the parent principle. I'm not an orphan, even though they're dead. My wife is gone, but she's always with me. Um, I don't feel like a widower or, I mean, I miss her, but um, I know what she thinks or what she would say. So I still share my life with her. And with the gurus, it's more subtle. 
and uh, important in a way. They say beyond this life and everything, and they'll call you by your Dharma name in the Bardo after you die. Now I'm getting into cosmology, excuse me. But they say you're, they'll call you by your Dharma name after you die and, and you go you know, in that direction into the light or be reborn in their realm where they are to continue on the path together. So that's a little thought you can check out and see for yourself you know, about staying in touch with those that inspire you. So you go in that direction together in whatever form it is, whether you can conceive of it or not. I think that's very important. And my gurus are always with me. So Nyosho Kempo has been reborn in the Himalayas and recognized as a Tuku and incarnate Lama, but I haven't gone to meet him. Not that I won't, but you know, um, he, I meet my teacher in my practice every morning, or even now talking about him, or seeing a few of them on my little altar here in my studio workspace. It used to be my writing studio, now it's my communication and broadcast tower. But here they are. And of course, they're not a picture or a statue, but it's a, it's a subtle inspiration. It's like a ray, it's like a vibration. You know, whether the sun's behind the clouds or not, it's light today and you know that that's sunlight, even though there's no blazing rays at the moment, but the blaze, the warmth, the love is there. And I think that's an important thing that we can look into and cultivate if we have a relation with uh, an inspiring spiritual master, mentor, or even love object that they're always with us and love is, beyond, is greater than death. Amen, as it says in a good book. Like somebody might die, but the love continues. Love is greater than death. And that's why we practice devotion, transmuting emotion into devotion and, and compassion and seeing how it takes us beyond our selfish selves, our limited, narrow, egocentric concerns and includes others. Just like you want to share the goodness with others when you tell them, oh, did you see that great Netflix show? Or the new restaurant? Or whatever it is, you know, read that great book by, not, not by Suridas, you know, but by Suridas's friend, like somebody else. Eckhart Tolle, have you read that book by Eckhart Tolle, Power of Now? It's a terrific book. With no Asian jargon. So we you naturally share stuff with people, the goodness because that's our good heart. Original goodness, I call it, not original sin, like some of my Catholic friends are burdened with. Original goodness, before the fall from the garden, it was the garden, damn it. That's what Buddhism is emphasizing, the original uncorrupted clear light or the inner Buddha divine nature, uncorrupted by our habits. So that helps me with grieving and loss also because grieving for my wife, grieving for my gurus, it's not exactly entirely grieving. It's also a form of love. It warms my heart. Thank it you. It warms my heart. You, you addressed what I was going to bring up, you know, um, because a lot of the, the students here um, are new. And, and I often say, if you're inspired uh, towards the Buddhist path, find a teacher. There's, you know, there's lots of opportunities now online. There's online teachings all the time. And some of the students have actually taken refuge with Garchin Rinpoche and possibly others. Um, but you spoke to the, how the guru, you know, is that source of inspiration and light. Um, if you could, because we have read a bit and discussed some of Nyosho Kempo's teachings, as well as Dilu Kense Rinpoche, if you could speak to the, those two masters and their qualities, um, that would be, I, I, that's something personally I wanted to ask. Well, I'm glad you mentioned uh, your guru, Root Lama, as we call him, Ben Garchan Rinpoche. He's a tremendous, saintly, wonderful yogi, master, lama, you know, everything that should be. And he has those qualities too. But you asked me about my teacher. So we're all in the same accomplishment lineage coming down from, you know, not just Buddha, but specifically Milarepa, Longchamp, and Jimmy Lingpa, the Mahamudra and Ka and Dzogchen lineage, but in English, the Tibetan Buddhist lineage, whatever you want to call it, Mahayana, Vajrayana, these are all jargon, but, you know, we all uh, inherit that and learn from that, just like in the West, this so-called Judeo-Christian tradition, you know, whichever part we are part of or our parents were part of. So we're kind of imbued with that, but also we don't have much perspective or background in it. So it's good to learn a little bit about it. That's why, like I said, even yesterday I was reading the biography of the 16th Karmapa, who I knew personally and traveled with even in the 70s. 
and he passed in 1981 and is reborn now. Uh, he's a great Lama. So Kinsumche and, and Kempo and these gurus are Dzogchen masters. That means they're like masters of uh, themselves and the world and non-dual awareness beyond life and death. And that's a big accomplishment. It means they've spent 20, 30, 40 years meditating, praying, fasting, purifying themselves in order to cultivate these, let's call them cardinal virtues, like the cardinal virtues in Buddhism are the paramitas, the transcendental virtues. In Christianity, there's the seven cardinal virtues, you know, becoming a better person, generosity, ethics, all those things, patience, resilience, wisdom, compassion, love, so that we can be better people and contribute to a better world. But more specifically, some say they had Siddhis, ma magic powers. For me, their greatest magic power is their unconditional love and treating everybody the same, in, in meaning like according to their needs, not according to the uh, person's, uh, the giver's selfish needs. But um, my teachers, just being with them was joy. I remember Sogyal Rinpoche, who was a disciple and nephew of Kinsey Rinpoche, used to say, just being in the presence of Nyosho Kempo Rinpoche was joy. Even though he had had a stroke and was like an, he called himself an outpatient in his own poems, a permanent outpatient Kempo, because he always had a headache and double vision when we knew him as an old man. Still, just being with him was joy. And he was so spontaneous and fun. And uh, I remember when it was hot in our three-year tree center in France, and he was a resident llama, and he, he had like an ice bag on his head with a rag holding it, and it was dripping down while he was giving us the most profound Dzogchen teachings out in the garden. And he was still too hot because it was in southern France, and it was the summer, it was hot. So he called somebody over to bring the sprinkler over, and he had the sprinkler going like this, back and forth, and sprinkling him. And of course, it got all of us too. He didn't care. He was busy giving the Dharma and loving the, the 20 of us in front of him. It was hot. Let's cool off while we're doing this. So that's also an example of engaging compassionately in the world. Like let's cool off. And yet we're still doing this profound transmission and teaching and not worrying about how it looks or whether it's like spick and span or, you know, like pompous professor or anything like that. So joy was a big thing. And Dingo Kinsey Rinpoche too, who was the Dalai Lama Dzogchen master and really Lama of Lamas. He was Chogim Trumpa Rinpoche's Lama. He was a wonderful Lama. He's also reborn and lives in Bhutan now, has a monastery in Kathmandu, you can study there. He's a great Lama. And he, there are books about him, but you know, I exhort you to look into the YouTubes and the movies and get the, with, let's say three-dimensional experience of the sound and the voice and the movement and the buoyant laughter. Like Kinsey Rinpoche woke up every morning at three or four in the morning and meditated for four hours and chanted and turned the pages of his prayer books and was not really very dressed. He was like a yogi in his gotkas, my mother would say in Yiddish, meaning his underwear. <laughs> anyway, but, but the prince and princesses of Nepal and Bhutan would come, and, and us, would, whoever would come in and out of the room and bow down, and he wouldn't talk because he was doing his chants and prayers, meditations, but he would put his hand on our head and bless him. So he had time for everybody. He wasn't worrying about us disturbing his meditation. He was unmoved. You know, he was in this world, but not of it. And if you see the Dalai Lama, who's a different personality, who's a world diplomat and leader and peace activist, as well as his master, spiritual saint and master. He's unmoved. He's in the world, but not of it. He's busy, but he's centered and peaceful. And that's an example to all of us how to engage compassionately. And Kinsey Rinpoche traveled the world three or four times in his 70s teaching at being invited, even though he had a hard time walking and didn't speak Western modern languages. And this is an example to us all, I think. We can all fulfill this altruistic, compassionate bodhisattva vow. I mean, it's something to consider. Thank you. So those gurus inspired me to be like that because that's the message, not worship one Buddha that lived 25, 600 years ago, but become peace, right. become that, become awakened, become a light in the world rather than a blight on the landscape.
I wish that for the, those who are interested, not proselytizing. All you beautiful people, just consider that it's a good Thank time you. for us to pull together before we're pulled apart. Thank you. Thank you. Um, last question I have for you from Cake. She asks, which of your books should I start with? Well, if your name is Cake, I think that you should, you know, really enjoy your, your own authentic sweetness. And, and the Buddha with Awakening the Buddha Within is a good, is a good one. It's all in there. It goes down easy. Uh, it depends on if you're familiar with, you know, these things or not. Um, I love my book of Tibetan teaching tales told by lamas called The Snow Lion, Turquoise Mane, Wisdom T Tales from Tibet. Um, Natural Great Perfection is a good book. Natural Radiance, it has a CD in the back with 10 guided meditations, but it's all about Dzogchen Pith Instructions. Natural Radiance from Sounds True. If you can find some machine to play an antique CD on, you'll be, you'll be halfway there. Natural Radiance. Or just, you know, look me up online or get some, click onto some free guided meditation and see what, what it does for you. Experience is the way. Study and practice. I can't emphasize that enough. We've all gone to 15 or 20 years of school, but I don't know how much of the experiential aspects we have really experienced. So I want to learn, that's why we're in the practicing lineage, right, Michael? And Gotchen Rinpoche himself, although he's a philosopher, he doesn't teach philosophy. He teaches just how to wake up and be enlightened. And he's such a great yogi, which is experiential, not yeah. theoretical. Yes, not, not intellectual solely. Right. Yeah. Um, thank you, Lomala. What, what's the best way for the students to keep, you know, to stay in tune with what you're doing and follow you online and teaching? Well, like my antediluvian uh, CDs and videos that I have out there and, you know, in-person retreats that you have to drag your body to in person. We also have virtual retreats like uh, one days and weekends. You can find out about these things on my websites, www.zogchen.org and www.surya.org or my social media feeds. You can just Google my name. Our Zogchen Center sends out regular things or my weekly free weekly words of wisdom. All these things are available through the magic of modern media. No, oh, I love your uh, Instagram account. Um, our producer is putting up that information right now. Uh, yes, thank you. Wonderful. Yeah, I love your Instagram and the and the, the teachings that you share from the great lamas. And I can't thank you enough for today, for your generosity, for your kindness, for your insight and your wisdom. My pleasure. Um, we are very, very grateful. Um, and with that, let's dedicate the merit of today's uh, gathering for the benefit of all beings by saying our closing prayer by this merit. May all be detained in the state of enlightenment, conquer the enemies of faults and delusions, and they be liberated from the source of samsara and its pounding waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death. Lamba, thank you very much. I wish you all the best. I hope I get to see you soon. I hope I see you soon. Look forward to it. I see you now. Joy to one and all. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. I see you, Avatar. Bye bye. All the best. Thank Love you to all. one and all. Yes. Take care.